Hey everyone, today we're in my office where I'm gonna go over the bones of the upper extremity and the pectoral girdle. Okay, let's talk about the scapula. Um, this right here is the spine of the scapula and it's on the posterior side. So we like to teach students to remember that is just how our spines are on our posterior side, so is the spine of the scapula. So this is posterior. The glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity, which creates the socket and the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, that is going to be lateral. So we have posterior, later, lateral, if we turn this around, anterior, medial. So let's go over some of these fossas. Here I just have the first part of the word written down. Supra stands for supraspinous fossa. Infra is infraspinous fossa. And supra means above, so above the spine. So that's what supraspinous means. And then infra meaning below, below the spine, infraspinous. On the anterior side, we have the sub scapular fossa. These are important because uh, we have four rotator cuff muscles that are actually going to attach to these parts. The supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and then there's another muscle called the uh, teres minor that will attach to this area. And then on the opposite side, the uh, subscapularis muscle. Uh, those are going to basically come around and those help keep that shoulder joint stable. Then on the end, we have the acromion, which is known as the tip of the shoulder. Another interesting fact is that acromion actually means highest in Greek. And so when we look at it from this view, you can see that's the highest point on the scapula. And then the other process is something called the coracoid process. That actually means raven. So it's named because it kind of looks like a raven's beak. Okay, now let's talk about the clavicle. And the clavicle has two main ends. We have this acromial end. And the way I like to teach the acromial end is that it actually looks like a smaller version of the acromion. So the acromial end of the clavicle looks like a smaller version of the acromion. kind of flip that up you could see that looks very similar and it's named as such because it will articulate we actually call that the acromial clavicular joint or the AC joint for short then the opposite side that is going to be the sternal end so this is lateral this is medial this is actually anterior and posterior so this is a kind of a bird's eye view we're looking at the top down. The sternal end is going to look more blunt and square-like. So that will articulate with the sternum very nicely there. Okay, let's take a look at the humerus. And the first thing I like to point out on the humerus is this depression right here called the olecranon fossa. The olecranon fossa, remember that a fossa is a depression, is a place where the olecranon process will fit into. And I'll show that in just a little bit here. But this fossa is going to be on the posterior side, so you know you're looking at the back side of this bone. The other thing is the head. The head of the humerus makes up the ball of the ball and socket joint, and we know that has to go medially in order to create that joint. So if the head is medial, and you know you're looking at the back side of the bone, it makes sense then that this is the left humerus. So let's flip this over. Here we have the greater tubercle, which makes this the lesser. And even though I don't have it labeled as such, I like to point it out because in between those two is this groove called the intertubercular groove. It's also known, known as the bicipital groove. When we go over the muscles, we're going to tie in all these bone features with the muscular system. 
So a reason why we have the groove is because more than likely we're gonna have some type of muscle attachment. So this groove is actually where we're gonna have the insertion of the latissimus dorsi and part of the biceps brachii comes through this little grooved area. This little bump right here, so again, we're on the anterior side of the humerus. This little bump on the anterior side is called the deltoid tuberosity. And the reason why it's called the deltoid tuberosity, maybe you've already put this together, is because the deltoid muscle is going to attach to this part of the humerus. Remember that the head is going to be at the proximal end of the bone which means closest to the point of, the point of attachment, and it's where this limb attaches to the torso, which means this stuff down here is going to be distal. So let's look at these distal structures here. This part is going to be called the uh, trochlea, and then this little kind of ball-like structure is the capitulum. So the medial section is the trochlea, the lateral section is the capitulum. If we were to turn this around, we could see that there's that trochlea. The trochlea is going to articulate with the ulna, the capitulum articulates with the head of the radius. And again, when I go over those two bones, I'll hold them up and that might make more sense there. So here, I just wanna show you how these two bones articulate together. We're looking at the posterior side and we know that because this right here is the olecranon fossa of the humerus and then here we have the scapular spine. So when we put these two bones together, you can see how shallow that is. This is why the shoulder joint is, um, it's easy to dislocate because we really don't have a lot of bone over bone like we do in the hip joint. Um, we have these four muscles that are gonna wrap over and basically hold everything together like that. And that's something that we'll cover once we go to the muscular system. All right, here we have the ulna. And the easiest way, in my opinion, to tell that this is the ulna is by knowing what this trochlear notch looks like. So this notch right here is the trochlear notch, but if we turn the bone on its side, it makes a U shape. So if you see this U shape, you can think U for ulna, therefore you are holding the ulna bone. On the uh, opposite side of that, so this is actually gonna be the left ulna, so on the lateral side of the ulna, we have this little notch called the radial notch. And the reason why it's called the radial notch is because that is where the head of the radius will articulate. And I will show you that articulation after I, I go over those parts of the bone. This part on the posterior side, this is our olecranon process, which is your elbow. So if you palpate, or feel your elbow, this is actually what you are touching. Again, I will show you what that joint actually looks like. This is the proximal end of the bone because this creates the elbow joint, which means this is the distal end. This little part that comes out like this is the styloid process. And a way that I remember that is if I pretend that this ulna is a stylus, a stylus pen, if I were to write with it, I'm writing with the styloid process. Okay, here we have the radius. Um, the radius um, just has kind of this smooth radial head. Remember that articulates with the capitulum of the uh, humerus, and I'll show that articulation. So this part right up here, which is the proximal end, is the head. Then this bump right here, 
That is called the radial tuberosity. The reason why we need to know the radial tuberosity is because when we talk about the muscles chapter, we're gonna see that the biceps brachii muscle actually inserts to this little bump here. And then down at the distal end, we have another styloid process. So same thing if you were to pretend this was a stylus pen and write with it, that's the styloid process. And another way to distinguish this from the ulna, other than the U-shaped trochlear notch in the ulna, is that the distal end of the radius is much wider. And the reason why it's wider is because this part is what articulates with uh, most of the proximal carpal bones, your wrist bones. So those little wrist bones are gonna make contact with this area right here. So let me show you these two bones together. We can see that the head of the radius articulates in that radial notch, just like that, so it snuggles up like that. And then, um, and that's what helps create the elbow joint. So this is proximal. This is the distal end. Okay, so this again would be, well, let me get these together. This would be the elbow. This would be the wrist. The ulna is going to be pinky side or medial because we're always going from anatomic position, which means the radius is going to be lateral or thumb side. So knowing that this is the anterior side of the bones and that this is medial and that is lateral, that should show you that we are looking at the left ulna and the left radius. So now let's look at the right hand. So here we have the thumb, also known as the pollux, and then we have the second, third, fourth, fifth digits. So um, parts of the hand, we have the carpal bones, then we have the metacarpals, and then we have the phalanges, the fingers. And the phalanges are going to be made up of these sections. We will have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. The thumb is a little bit unique in that it only has a proximal and distal. And this is why maybe you've heard um, that thumbs are not technically fingers. It is a digit, so we have five digits on each hand, so we have 10 digits, but we actually only have eight fingers because we ha only have um, one interphalangeal joint is what that's called right there. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Please hit like and subscribe so you don't miss any new content. I'll see you next time.